on today's show for what has felt like an eon of being kept in emotional dismay and captivity and disappointment. The San Diego Padres finally get themselves a win thanks to the return of one Sir Hugh Darvish and a huge game time decision for Mike Schilt, as well as the continued hot streak of Jerks and Profar. All that and more. Let's get to it. You are locked on Padres. Your daily San Diego Padres podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Locked On Padres podcast, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day for Wednesday. May 1st. Happy May, everybody. Hopefully all of you are enjoying the first day of this new month. Of course, as always, I'm your host with Sometimes Occasionally, but certainly not always the most, Javier Reyes. You might be familiar with some of my baseball-related work over at JustBaseball.com, where I write about not just the Padres, but general baseball stuff in general. Very good website. I also host a podcast for them, another one if you can't if you can't get enough podcasting from your boy, called Baseball vs. the World, where I recently did the City Connect Power Rankings with a special guest in Ethan Budowski. You can go check that out. You can also check me out on Twitter if you would like, at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. And we are free and available on all platforms, of course, as you know. And folks, finally, we get to do an episode with a little bit more levity, a little bit more happiness, as the San Diego Padres got themselves a, like, it, it's it's weird to call anything this early, like, a must-win. But just in terms of vibes, man, this felt like a must-win. It really did. And it didn't start off on a hot note. It really did it. This was this was a little scary, and there's still, even despite the win, some criticisms that I do have of the team in general. Uh, a lot of things didn't go their way. This wasn't a clean blowout victory or even a walk-off or anything like that. I thought that it was a little bit, it was actually a little bit of an ugly game, at least in my opinion. But, folks, we're going to get all into that stuff today. Today's episode, guys, is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on MLB and use code all lowercase locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. For today's episode, folks, the vibes are good. The vibes are good. And we are immediately, immediately going to have to talk about you, Darvish, because you, Darvish, is a little bit of a mini vibes king. Yes, he has been inconsistent over the years. Yes, his health has been the big issue, and he just returned. But I think all things considered, the guy was amazing, like genuinely amazing. Although he only went five innings and only threw 70 pitches, he certainly wasn't bad. Five innings, no earned runs, no walks, three strikeouts, just three hits allowed. Um, I liked what I saw. I think what we saw was kind of like the best case scenario for you, Darvish, where he's just this guy who can be... Not like the big strikeout guy. I've talked about this before, but a couple years ago when his strikeout rate declined, he made up for it by not just getting hit really poorly and then just made up for it with with really good control. And while, yes, he would give up a homer every now and then and just that, that wouldn't be great. He'd still give up the hard contact. Although hard contact has never been a big issue with me for you, Darvish, because I feel like if you're able to finally make contact with him in the right way, like it can usually lead to some big hits. Um, I'm just not concerned about that. Um and he comes back and is really good. Look, 3.45 ERA on the season. He's been officially, after that, basically the second best starter for the Padres. Um, one thing about his starts is that while he hasn't been insanely good before this, he was a 4.18 ERA guy. He's at the very minimum, and this was a thing heading into the season, which was, I think at the minimum, he's going to be at least a good starter as long as he's healthy. Maybe he won't return to that Cy Young thing or the all-star thing from 2021 or the fully complete campaign that he had in 2022 but he's still going to be I think a very effective pitcher and having him back cannot be understated like just because it's possible that the Darvish of old is gone and you're not going to get those type of starts where he goes seven innings only gives up one earned run and gets seven K's or something like that it's okay like he still can be effective and I think that with this team in theory the starting rotation should be able to make up for any any pitcher who doesn't pitch at a ace Cy Young level right we don't just have to have what you got from Blake Snell last year in fact the big issue with the Padres has just been inconsistency with guys like Michael King, with guys like Joe Musgrove especially, um, which we talked about on yesterday's show, like which one are you more concerned about? And I think that with Darvish here, against a team that's hungry, a team that can get really on you fast, I know that the Reds aren't like quite as dynamic as, say, Ellie De La Cruz uh, would suggest. You know what I mean? Like As an offense, I feel like they're, they're just really solid and they're getting there, but they're a young, hungry team, and for you to do that well, I think is great. Hey, they're still 10th in runs scored, 
right? Does that mean that they've been great on average? No, not necessarily, especially Padres fans. You can relate to that too, where the Padres are, I believe, what are they, like fourth in run scored? Let me check this, by the way. I forgot. They are third in run score, so I was, so I was close. Like, yeah, a lot of that feels like they are a little bit like they jump on teams when they're already up. I do understand that. But even still, they've scored a lot of runs, and the offense, of course, does return today too, which we'll get at in a little bit. But uh, I can't emphasize enough. Like, that was a much-needed start for Darvish. There wasn't, like, a lot of swing and miss. Only two whiffs on 16 swings for his slider, um, his most-used pitch of the night. So it wasn't anything like oh my God, this guy's amazing. But nonetheless, for you to come out when the Padres need a big win, Darvish still has that factor in him. Whether this is fair or whether this is like old school of me and it's ignoring analytics, I don't really care. He still has that vibe that like in a big game, there's few starters that you want instead of him, at least on this Padres team, I should say. Um, He just has that vibe to him. I know that he had the Dodgers series back when he was with the Dodgers, but That is also looked at a little bit differently because I believe that series was in 2017 when the Astros got found out for their whole scandal. But, like, Darvish, what what more can I say? The guy was really effective, and I'm very, very happy that he is on the San Diego Padres, although that does not excuse, um, what's it called, The, the contract, in my opinion. I still think the contract decision was very foolish. I just thought that I didn't understand why you were extending a guy until he's in his late 40s. Like, before you had to, you could have just waited till free agency and then probably got him for, like, three years for a lot less um, based on the season that he had last year. Like, just very, very weird stuff from Preller, and that's not – I'm not defending that, right? Like, I'm not defending the – I'm saying in a vacuum, like, as a pitcher, I still think he could be effective. So, shouts to you, Darvish. And shouts to the fact that starting this game off with a 1-2-3 inning, I saw a lot of people joking on Twitter being like, all of San Diego breathes a sigh of relief. Unbelievable. They managed to get through the first inning unscathed because as of late, the pitching has been so, so bad, particularly with starting pitching. Um, and yes, I know the bullpen had that blow up and there was some bullpen issues in this game too. But for the most part, it hasn't been them. It's been the starting pitching, just never knowing what you're going to get. It's always wild. You know what I mean? And it's kind of really affected them because the Padres offense, at least on the superficial not superficial, the tertiary level like of runs scored and home runs and batting average and on base, they've been among like some of the top 10, you know, in all those categories in baseball. So just really cool to see. And I love that everyone was joking about that. The one, two, three inning was phenomenal <laughs> to start off the game, uh, especially with Ellie De La Cruz at the top of that lineup who hit one to Mars uh, yesterday against Matt Waldron. So really good stuff from you, Darvish. And I think that with this Padres team, um, if they're going to go far, if they're going to be effective, especially with how King and um, and Musgrove have been, they are going to need Darvish to step up big, at least until those two get right, if they ever get right. I have more optimism about Joe Musgrove. I think I'm the only one, um, as opposed to Michael King, but we'll have to see. We'll have to see how that goes down. But for now, much needed, good start. Just a normal thing from the Padres, thank God, right? But the Padres as a whole did not really exceed my not not exceed they didn't do in my opinion play all that well yesterday yes they get the 6-4 win but they also have some errors go they were their way they have some batted balls there's a spencer steer error at one point with the jackson merrill fly ball there's an error at third base i'm pretty sure that occurs in this one yeah the reds made three errors on the night like that was a big part of this that was a big part of this but at least the, the padres did win i'm just throwing it out there just to critique that like still they still had some moments. They still had some moments with runners on base that they didn't get a clean hit with, although they did get one big one that we're going to talk about in a second. Um, so it wasn't a super great game. My biggest favorite thing that happened, though, is you, Darvish. Excellent, excellent work from Darvish. Hopefully he can carry that going forward and, you know, be a guy that we can rely on a, a decent amount. But ladies and gentlemen, that's of course not all. Uh, In terms of that first inning, before we go to break, I just want to shout out that the Padres, once again, like, and I tweeted about this, like, this team is amazing. They start off bases loaded with nobody out. Profar gets a single, who, by the way, goes three for four on the day. Um, Tatis draws a walk. Cronenworth hits into a fielder's choice, swings at a ball that was, like, a really poor swing. And then, of course, there's an error, which allows him to get on base. And the fact that then you get a Machado line out, which, for the record, he might have gotten unlucky on. Right, like he might have, it was expected batting average according to Baseball Savant of 590, but he lines out, caught by Cruz uh, up the middle. Bogarts hits a horrible, like, just a horrible swing that barely goes anywhere. Weak contact, fly ball, and then Jackson Merrill flies out, um, although he made slightly better contact. That's frustrating. And it was especially frustrating to see how quickly all of them went down, right? Like, that was 
arguably the most frustrating thing, and that's always one of the frustrating things about the Padres, is that the situational hitting and just the putting together really good at-bats doesn't seem to happen very often outside your Profars and maybe even your Hassan Kims, who sees a decent amount of pitches per appearance. Uh, just a little frustrating, but nonetheless, they still get the W. We're going to break it down even further, guys, but before we do that, I want to take a second to talk to you about someone who might help you for this Mother's Day. Ladies and gentlemen, someone that might help you if you're in the mood for a big old grubbin, and that is our good friends over at DoorDash. Look, ladies and gentlemen, here's the deal: fifty percent off your next order, up to fifteen dollars when you spend fifteen plus more on your next flower convenience, grocery or retail order on DoorDash with the code Locked On MLB. See, it's easy. You don't even. It's not even going to be that hard to remember. You, you won't even have to look and listen to this podcast again. That's how easy of a code it is. So shouts to the people at DoorDash, guys. And what I love about it is, look, if you need same-day delivery stuff, DoorDash has you covered. You guys know all these delivery apps are all the hip, trendy thing these days. Um, so go check them out, um, folks. It is really, really cool. And, hey, Mother's Day is coming up. May 12th. May 12th, just to remind y'all out there who might have forgotten. So if your mom, maybe maybe she's feeling a little sweet toothy, you could do that. Maybe you want flowers. Boom. I, mentioned, I just mentioned groceries and whatnot. Boom. They've got all that stuff, too. They've got everything you could need over at DoorDash, and they get it to you same day. And if you use the code LOCKDOWNMLB, you get 50% off your next order, up to $15 when you spend 15 plus on your next flyer, convenience, grocery store, or retail order, whatever, on DoorDash. So go check that out, guys. Order using DoorDash today. Remember, LOCKDOWNMLB for that 50% off. Go check it out and keep on dashing. I added that part at the end. I don't think that's like a, a slogan of theirs, but still, I, I don't know. You got to go fast, I guess, sometimes, right? Uh, next, though, I want to talk to you guys about the number one fantasy sports app in the nation, and that, of course, is Prize Picks, folks. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. All you have to do is pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Look, baseball's underway. NBA playoffs are killing it. NHL playoffs are killing it. And before you know it, football will probably be here. And prize picks will be there for that too. But in terms of prize picks in general, they have everything. And one thing that I really do like as well is that they have like an injury insurance thing. So basically like, uh, for for example, like your entry stays in play if your batter like is taken out early and gets two uh, plate appearances or less. So like don't worry about that. That won't ca- count as a loss. So that's really, really good. Just in case you have like a situation where, you know, Jackson Merrill g- g- gets pulled out of the game or something like that. Don't worry. They have you covered, and they've got all sorts of stat types that you can go off of, not just, you know, hits and runs, like all sorts of things that you could do. Really, really cool, um, and you should check it out, guys. So go check it out. Download the app today and use code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Remember, that is code LOCKEDONMLB after you download the app and use the code to get a deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with Price picks. And just like that, we are back, ladies and gentlemen, on the Locked On Padres podcast, your team every day, free and available on all platforms, folks. Let's continue talking about the recap, because I just mentioned the first inning, not the best of starts. It was very Padres. Like, we were like, oh my God, they're doing this again. Bases loaded, nobody out. And again, I do give Machado credit. Like, it was just a little bit unlucky, didn't put the ball at the right place, but made good contact. And it turns out to be a little bit of an omen, a little bit of a foreshadow, a little bit fortuitous, dare I say, for what happens for the rest of the game. Um... And I already mentioned that the Reds did play sloppy in this game um, overall. Like, I just mentioned with the bases loaded getting out, Cronenworth swung at a horrendous pitch that was inside that probably should have been a double play. Um, And I wouldn't have even been mad because Cronenworth really has been productive. And by the way, one of the first runs that the Padres score in this game is in the bottom of the third after Tatis gets a double and then Cronenworth singles him in. I just want to quickly just mention, by the way, um, that Tatis, I had tweeted yesterday as a joke mostly as a joke you know I'm, I'm just a little bit of a, a troll poster i guess every now and then where i tweeted that um don't let kendrick lamar's new diss track distract you from the fact that tatis is slashing 175 284 298 over his last 15 games this was before last night's game and some people responded being like you know Devin sports gospel got on me and was like you know why look at you know, why watch the games when you could just look at the, you know, the stat box score things and all that. Someone else responded. My guy Tanner uh, who responded to me being like, Javi, 
<laughs> he said, look, I'll let it slide because I know that you know uh, that there's some good underlying numbers for him. The way that I describe, um, just to get it out there, how I feel about Padres players is that Tatis, for me, I'm very confident that he's going to be great. Very confident. Machado, I'm optimistic that he'll be great. Bogarts, the Anthony Rendon allegations are right there. Like the Bogarts is the actual true player that I'm worried about because his underlying things don't look good. The only thing he has going for him is that he is able to draw walks and not swing at bad pitches and that he's Xander Bogarts. But other than that, it's been a nightmare. And frankly, it he literally looks like a player that needs reps in AAA right now. I'm not trying to be like a jerk or hyperbolic, but that's literally what he looks like. And I've said it before. Hard hit doesn't explain everything. It doesn't. A good example of this is that Trent Grisham always had a high hit rate. Um, and he actually had like a hard hit rate spike in the second half past couple seasons where it was like, oh my God, like, is he figuring it out? So no, it's not everything. But for you to be a guy who had that issue, had an injury issue, for it to go down significantly one year and then to drop even more the next year, that's why I'm concerned about Bogarts. This isn't like a, a one-off, oh, wow. What happened? He was really great last year. He's having, This is now second year in a row where the drop-off has happened. It's hard hit. So I don't know. I don't know what else to tell you guys about Bogars. But um, in terms of Tatis, the only thing that I legitimately don't think, though, is maybe this isn't going to be like his MVP season. That's totally, I think, a reasonable take. Only because he's doing that same thing where I feel like he presses a little bit at the plate, where he does swing at some of those first pitches. It feels like he's trying to leave the yard. Has he been a little bit unlucky? Of course, right? Like, that's the big thing with Tatis is over those last 15 games, the sample side, his weighted on base versus expected weighted on base, which is what I personally like to use the most when judging uh, slumping players who are hitting the ball really hard. Like, if there's a huge discrepancy between the two, then I really like looking at that. Um, And for Fernando Tatis Jr., he's got one of the, the greater splits in that area for a guy who hits the ball as hard as he does. Um, in terms of his weighted on base, he's got 338, and his expected weight on base is 400. Like, that is too much of a... just. If it was, like, 360, I'd be like, uh, maybe he's not going to rebound into being a superstar. But if it's 400, I'm like, oh, it's going to be great. I do wonder, though, because of the fact that he's been pressing, and that's one thing he did last year, and I, it could be a product of just really wanting to get back to that jolt, get back to what he was in 2021 and 2022 where you're just like, or not 2022, 2021 where you're just really excited and you want to, you know, help this team and be the hero and, you know, help get everybody excited again with the medallions and the swag chains and the photos and the the flexing, all that stuff. Um, I do wonder about that. He's been slightly inconsistent on defense this year. Most of that, in my opinion, coming from some early on games Um, and the fact that he just hasn't had like as many opportunities to throw runners out, which I think... And I talked about this last year that I think that his defensive run saved uh, metrics, I think, did get not inflated. Inflated isn't the right word because he's a very good defender and he gets to the ball quick. Inflated would be an example of inflated defensive stats, maybe for me, would be like Profar's year in 2022, where he just got so much defensive value from the fact that he threw out like six runners in two weeks or whatever because they all kept running on him as opposed to his overall arm strength, his range, his catching ability, all that stuff. Um, Where Tatis, all those latter attributes are there, but he hasn't had too many opportunities to throw people out aside from that bum Trey Turner in Sunday's game, which was really great, and then uh, a couple weeks ago against the Brewers. Um, But still, I think he'll be good there. I'm not worried. Like It says he's in the... He's got zero outs of average. Don't worry about it. Like, give him time, and I think that he's going to get a lot better. Um, but anyway, back to the game recap, folks. Um, in terms of the rest of this game, though, basically nothing happens for a good while uh, for the next couple innings, right? You get to the bottom of the fifth, and this is the story of the game. It is Mike Schilt. First of all, Tyler Wade gets a single, which means that he, of course, is going to start the next 15 games unabated. Uh, so can't wait for that. Profar gets a single. Again, three for four. Guys, I'm really starting to wonder about Profar. Like, I'm really starting to be like, oh my gosh, like, is this guy just going to be really good? Frankly, he's literally already worth what the Padres paid him, which is one million bucks. So, like, I'm not, right? Like, e- even if... He has a fall off. This has already been so amazing. And it's, again, I I don't really know what else to say. Like, he's just been so, so phenomenal uh, this year. I love him very much. Even if, yeah, um, you know, there's a couple moments where you're like, eh, his defense isn't great. It's okay, though. It doesn't really matter. Uh, So, shouts to him. And he did get a little bit lucky in this game. Uh, One of his singles had an expected batting average of 10. So, he did get a little bit lucky on that. But the other two, he did not. So, 
Good job, bro. Um, in this game, after you get that, then you get a fielder's choice. Again, a lot of errors by the Reds, which is why this isn't an enthusiastic W for me. Just a much needed, like, whew, sigh of relief W. Does that make sense? Sigh of relief win versus enthusiastic win. As I hit Tatis on the head, the bobblehead. Um, that's what it felt like. But anyway, then Cronenworth, here's where the thing comes in. Reaches on a catcher's interference. Because originally, though, it was a ground out and fielder's choice that allowed, um, I believe, um, Tyler Wade to score. Um, and he did score. And instead, Mike Schultz, instead, and there are very rare times when you come across a situation. This isn't football, right? This isn't football. This isn't the NBA or anything like that, especially football with, you know, declining and accepting penalties. That's always a thing, I think, there. He could have just let the run, let that play happen, and then you get the free run, and then you're up, I think at the time, you would be up 2-0 for a team that's been really struggling lately to put together an offense. And instead, he elects not to, and he takes the the Jay Cronenworth catcher's interference, which my actually my mom had brought this up, uh, that she was like, does it feel like a lot more catcher's interference has happened lately? Leave your thoughts in the comments. I, maybe just watching the Padres, it's been weird. I don't think this is like some weird trend, but I feel like there's been a lot of catchers interference lately. Like, what's hasn't it happened with Profar like twice? Anyway, uh, that's all things. So they accept the catcher's interference. Bases load, nobody out, but they don't get the run. And Machado first pitch drills a double again. I'm optimistic about Machado turning into a better player. That was really great, and it makes up for the fact that he did get a little bit unlucky in the first inning with that 590 expected batting average. Again. It still needs to be emphasized that the Reds made a lot of errors. Three in this game. This inning doesn't necessarily happen if they, they don't fumble that play. And that first inning certainly doesn't happen um, if they don't fumble, um, what was it, the um, the Jay Cronenworth double play ball. But nonetheless, Machado rewarding his manager with the decision. I love that. I like that Schilt has like a fire to him. There's when it whatever whether it be the way he was responding to media after the questions about the Rocky series, I just like that he has a lot of fire to him. And that's not all from today's game. We're going to recap a couple more things, including some relieving uh, issues, some relief pitching issues that did not give us any sense of relief. We'll talk about that more as well as just praising Mike Schilt and talking a little bit more about a, a guy who I haven't talked about much in Schilt. But before we do that, ladies and gentlemen, I need to talk to you about the best game in the U.S. of A. And dare I say the world, ladies and gentlemen. And that, of course, is Marvel Midnight Suns. No, I'm just kidding. This is something I've been playing lately. But I've been what I've been really playing lately all the time, no matter where I am, is Monopoly Go, guys. And it's just like the classic game you know and love. Look, here's the thing. I know what you're saying. Look, you've already talked about this all the time. I'm going to throw a flag on the play. Unnecessary roughness? How would that... Advertisement? I don't know. But whatever. Unnecessary praise. Uh, number 69 on the Padres. Whatever. Like, because of my, my Padres jacket. Not the weird joke. Um, don't worry. Don't worry, ladies and gentlemen. The reason I'm bringing it up because Monopoly Go is fantastic. You can team up with your friends in all these different tournaments. They've got all these offers. You can unlock all these different boards. And me, you got to know something about me. I'm a big cosmetics guy, so I love unlocking new looks for things. And they've got plenty. They've got all these dynamic new boards. They've got unique stickers that help you fill up these albums. You could get new playing pieces like you know your top hat and whatnot. And then many more. I was always a car guy as a kid. But the top hat, man, when I got older, the top hat be speaking to me. You know what I mean? I got to be something I'm not, you know, which is classy. So shout to Monopoly, helping me fulfill my dreams. There's also all these emojis that you can unlock and taunt your friends because you got to be disrespectful, folks. That's what you got to do. There's always fun things to discover in Monopoly Go. So get off the bench and go download it for free now on the Google Play or App Store. Game on. And just like that, we are back, ladies and gentlemen, here on the Locked On Padres podcast. <laughs> Hope everybody's doing well. In the waning moments of this show, we must continue forth. And remember to keep sending me your questions and comments. I've gotten like a few on YouTube that I have to check, but uh, feel feel free to do that. And right when after we're done recapping this, uh, I'll give you guys a little bit of a tease of what we're doing for the rest of the week, as always. So in that inning, um, you know, Machado does get the double, and then Jackson Merrill reaches on Spencer Steers. Uh, fielding error, again, another error, which allows Manny Machado to score. Again, they did get very lucky. And then Tatis reaches on another fielder's choice later on with a ground out that ends up scoring um, Hassan Kim. And that basically 
uh, goes with the scoring. Tatis overall in this game, nothing impressive, but he did score two runs and he did have that nice double um, and a walk and a stolen base. So can this be the beginning of him turning it around? Absolutely. Again, the only thing with him so far has been that he hasn't gone like nuclear for a stretch, which like isn't necessarily a great way of judging a player, I know, but like he hasn't had that like Tatis, oh my God, he's a monster, like six game stretch or anything like that. He's had games, the two home run game against the, I believe it was the, was it the Cubs? Cubs or D-back? No, Giants. The Giants, when he hit those two home runs, was amazing. But other than that, been a little bit weird. Been a little bit weird. But he's going to turn it around, I think. Jerickson Profar, three for four. You get a much-needed RBI from Machado. Uh, Merrill. Merrill might be slowly hitting the rookie wall. I will say he hasn't looked as sharp lately. It's mostly because he hasn't hit, tapped into too much power. The last time he got a hit was the April 23rd game against the Rockies, just to give you guys an idea. So he hasn't been great there. He hasn't really gotten on base at all. So he's he's in a little bit of that rookie wall slump. Talked about this with Armley and about how he's going to take some time uh, to tap into the power. But at the very least, even if he slumps, guys, remember that can be outdone by the guys who should be performing. Tatis, Bogart, Machado, Kim, Cronenworth, all those type of guys. I'm not saying they all aren't, but that can be made up for with the guys you're expected to do well from. Not this kid who's going to be a rookie of the year candidate. And remember that as long as he's better than Grisham, that's such an upgrade for someone who's like 20 years old and can barely drink yet, right? So, shouts to that. Um, other than that, not too much to report. Bogarts goes one for four, whatever. A bloop single as usual. Um, everything else is fine. Uh, in terms of the rest of this game, though, I do want to talk uh, really, really quickly about a couple things. Number one, uh, relievers. No, relievers. And specifically, we got to talk about Adrian Bordejon. <sighs> Comes into this game, gets two outs, but gives up two earned runs on three hits. Oh, no walks, a strikeout. Gets hit a little bit to the point where they have to bring in Eniel De Los Santos, who comes in and is finally not good. Guy had a 0.77 ERA, and then he gave up two home runs. And look, it happens. He did have a nasty strikeout on one of his uh, sliders, by the way. That was incredible. Like, it was to, to get out of the jam that AJ Motorhorn was in, but gives up two solo shots. Look, at least the Padres had a lead. And in fairness, like I said, 0.7 ERA. He was going to give up something at some point. I don't think this guy's Josh Hader in his prime. I don't think this guy's Mariano Rivera. Like, but he's been really solid. So do not let that take away. I'm not worried about Santos. That was a. Hopefully he just got it out of his system. Like, it's going to happen sometimes, and he hung a couple pitches, but it happens. Um, Yuki Matsui makes up for it. One and two-thirds, gets two Ks in this, which I love to see. Uh, and then Robert Suarez comes in and shuts the door. But with AJ Monahon, man, it's just kind of epitomized the Padres a little bit, where, like, right when everyone was starting to pay attention, right when I got a question from one of you to answer on this podcast about whether or not I buy into Monahon as a reliever, which I, I still... And optimistic about him that he'll turn into a useful pitcher because he's always had a great fastball in terms of velo and whatnot. So if he works on that and some of the stuff plus metrics on it have been big, have been good. But um, it's just very Padres and very unfortunately, and this is mean, but it's kind of been the story of Adrian Monahan's tenure in San Diego and his career, right? Like it just feels like whenever we're starting to pay attention. He does not step up, and he doesn't become whatever it is that we need him to be. I'm still optimistic. They sent down, um, as as I mentioned the other day, they did send down um, Tom Cosgrove, who I feel like is this year's Luis Garcia or Nabil Krismat, one of those two. Like, great relievers who did well for you the previous year who just fell off a cliff. Um, hopefully Cosgrove can get it going back in the minors. I'm not rooting against him or anything like that. But, um, hey, can Monahone be effective? Absolutely. We've seen Santos, we've seen Matsui, and we've seen... Estrada come in and be awesome so far. That's been a nice little upgrade for this team. Don't sleep on that. That's This is why prospects can be fun. And then lastly, Robert Suarez comes into the game. His fastball looks fast on TV. Do you know what I mean by that? And I know that 99, oh, there's something about his delivery. I think it's more of an optical, like just my an aesthetic thing. But his fastball is just crazy, man. I mean, Robert Suarez, my lord. And that's always been a thing. I really like that. While he is, he doesn't get necessarily as many crazy strikeouts as you would like, and he does when he gets hit, he gets hit hard. The fact that he's been able to generate a little bit more strikeout stuff this year, 24.4% this year compared to 22.2% uh, last year, has been really good. His whiff percentage has been really even across the three pitches that he's focused on, which I've noticed so far this year. Um, only three pitches. Uh, he did throw a little bit more. Uh, pitches last year with his slider that he threw for 4.5% of the time. But this year, 
just a little bit more consistent. I like that he's been generating more whiffs. I like that he's putting away batters more with his sinker. That's what he's been using. It just feels like he's edited a couple things and he's been better. Um, he, I talked about him as one of the big X factors heading into the year, and he's absolutely succeeded so far. Um, in terms of comparing him to other relief pitchers, he's currently tied for 14th. Um, or tied for 13th, I believe, with Evan Phillips for the best ERA among relievers. Some other ones that I think that are really good that are above him. Um, Emmanuel Class A, that's elite. Um, Dylan Floro? I talked about how I was interested in Dylan Floro at one point. Don't know if he's elite, but still. Yami Garcia is really good. Um, Evan Phillips is really good. Clay Holmes of the New York Yankees is very good. He's also gotten a lot of uh, save opportunities. He has nine on the year. In fact, the only people that have more saves or in the same area, I should say, as Robert Suarez are Clay Holmes with nine. And then tied for the most are Ryan Helsley and Robert Suarez. So, chefs those guys. Rob, uh, Ryan Helsley, similarly, speak of the devil, he was a guy who was electric uh, two years ago with the Cardinals. And then fell off last year, and everyone's like, what happened? And then this year, he's back. Same thing for Robert Suarez. Electric two years ago, fell off last year, mostly due to injury, and is better this year. Um, he's going to give up something at some point. Um, he doesn't get as many strikeouts as I would like, the 24.2%. I'm still a little bit worried about that, which is why he's not in my elite tier yet, personally. And I know one of you, one of my listeners, I believe, responded like, what are you talking about? He's got 10 saves, and he's got a low ERA. How is he not elite? Just because I want a little bit more swing and miss. A little bit more if I'm going to put him in that tier. But one thing that is true, that is true, that's not an insult to say I just don't think he's elite tier. I think he's an A tier. Like, I think he's been a really effective relief pitcher. And it does mean something that you come in and save games. I know that, like, saves as a stat aren't the best way to judge relief pitchers. But I do still think it means a lot. Even if you're not striking out a bunch of people, and you're not doing that, that you're being an effective relief pitcher at just not blowing up games, especially for a guy who, especially with underlying metrics, when he does get hit, he gets hit hard. Uh, they're just not able to hit him. They're not able to put contact onto the ball because of just how damn fast the thing is. It bites on you. So love Robert Suarez this year very much. Mornohoan, I'm optimistic about, but hopefully he keeps it going. Um... You know, it's funny, actually, in this game, speaking of bullpen, uh, Emilio Pagan, former friend, and also Nick Martinez, former friend, I forgot to mention, starter for the Reds uh, in last night's game. It's just funny that Pagan, like, has given up more home runs among relief pitchers than anyone. I really, again, guys, it was a nice W, but the Padres really didn't play all that well. The Hassan Kim, you know, getting worked back in a count after being 3-0, and by the way, that count, uh, getting basically every strike call to go his way. Uh, as a ball, and then for you to be, you know, to strike out, and then Tyler Wade pops out. Not great. Again, not a very pretty game for the Padres. Pretty in terms of pitching, I think, yes. I know they had four runs given up. I know. But you saw some cool things with Matsui, with Suarez, and especially with you, Darvish, that it's some positives to take away from this game. Whether or not they can build on it, we'll have to see. They play a little bit earlier uh, in today. Uh, today, 4.10 p.m. for me. So that's like 1.10 uh, San Diego uh, Pacific Coast time. So shouts to you folks who get to go on your lunch break and watch the Padres. Um, hopefully they can win this one. And remember the feeling of the W, because if they win today's, all of a sudden, I promise you, all the fans that are being miserable, everyone's going to start getting a little bit more optimistic because that's how we are. Um, the big series is going to happen. What's really going to be a big thing is this D-back series this weekend against an arch rival, um, against a team that's, in my opinion, very good and has been slumping. Uh, just like the Padres, right? They've actually been slumping just like the Padres so far in a lot of ways. So hopefully we come out as that series this weekend being the one that we went off from. But speaking of the D-backs, guys, and also since we're at the end of the episode, in terms of the future of this podcast, tomorrow's episode, I'm going to be talking with Jeff Carr of Locked On Reds, doing a little bit of a series recap, getting his perspective on the whole thing. Maybe will these teams meet each other in the postseason? Are the Reds, you know, the upstart, fun, young team of the year? We'll be talking about all of that. And then... As I mentioned, the D-backs, Friday, Miller Thomas, longtime guest and homie friend goat of the show will be on to preview this weekend series um, against the D-backs. That should be a lot of fun. I haven't talked to him yet this season, I think. No, I think I have. I have I? I? I don't know. In terms of regular season, I don't know if I have, but really excited to talk to him about that and the, the Corbin Carroll slump and all that sort of stuff. So look forward to that. And also, go check out my new episode of Baseball vs. the World, again, with the City Connects I did with my friend Ethan. Uh, really, really fun episode. And I did not, I just want to be very clear, I reacted to his rankings that we gave superlative awards. I'm not responsible with where he ranked the Padres City Connect. Although I'm curious, leave your comment below. I'm just curious what you guys, my listeners, think of the Padres City Connect. I personally really like it, but curious to hear from you.
But with that all being said, everybody, that about does it for today's edition of Locked on Padres Podcast, the only pod that may be better than the pot Dre's themselves. Follow me on Twitter at Javipeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. Get the podcast where you're your podcast from, including the old YouTube. And until next time, stay safe. And of course, stay faithful. My fire faithful homies. Take care.